What is author marketing mastery through optimization, you ask? I'm gonna tell you. It's the best way for us authors to make a living selling our books. Are you tired of hearing gurus tell you your book is only good enough to be a lead magnet for services? Are you tired of feeling like you have to be a slave to social media and then frustrated when the time you spend doesn't actually help you sell books? I was too, until I found Ammo. Ammo is the only program that reliably produces results and it works for anyone. Is it hard work? You bet. Do you have to overcome some of your own prejudices to make Ammo work for you? Absolutely. But rather than being another program that rah rah shish boss tries to get you emotionally excited only to offer unclear methods, Ammo shows you how to design profitable ads step by step through a unique, highly tested and targeted formula. The founder, Steve Piper, is a data-loving, formula-driven author who escaped the kingdom of Amazon to build a platform for himself, where he sold directly to his readers and built a loyal following and millions of copies sold. With Ammo, you know who's reading your books, how to contact them, and what they want to read next. If you've always been frustrated with Amazon's wall of mystery of not knowing who's reading your books and losing 50 to 70% of your hard-earned money that you're making through sales, Ammo solves all of those problems by putting you in the driver's seat and showing you how to fulfill your books directly to your readership. Click the link in the show notes to learn more. My guest on today's show is or is my guests are, there it is. My guests are the Manning brothers, Brian and Alan. And boy, do we have a knockout fun episode for you. We're going to geek out about the Marvel comic universe movies. We're going to nerd out about Die Hard and Lethal Weapon. And overall, this is just a great conversation about how you can do your best marketing once you embrace what kind of books you're writing. That may sound so easy, but I think sometimes we're writing romances, but we're acting like intelligentsia, or we're writing thrillers, but we're acting like superheroes. And I really love what the Mannings have to say about embracing the genre and letting that lead the marketing. So I hope you enjoy this episode, um, and we will talk to you again on Monday. This is TRBM Ammo Edition. If you're a published author and want to make a living writing books and selling them to avid readers, you've come to the right place. There's simply no program that's more successful at driving readers towards the books you've written. So the only thing you have to worry about is writing a great book. And the system with an ammo takes care of the rest. Thanks for listening to this conversation. I'm Alan Manning. Uh, I'm, I We write action thriller fiction. And the only reason I'm starting first is because Brian's is going to be longer. He has more to say because <laughs> he started earlier than me. But anyways, we write action thriller fiction. It tends to be like more action movie flavored kind of a, I guess, PG-13 rating. Not necessarily, but you know, we, we don't, do anything excessively violent or obscene. And then I'm just going to leave it to Brian now. Uh, Yeah, my name is Brian Manning, obviously, uh, the other twin. Uh, Yes, we do write action thrillers. Uh, What basically happened was I started writing short stories in like around 2014, but we didn't really publish anything until uh, our first novel was a superhero novel in 2016. And then... Alan decided uh, we should just start writing action movies because that's what we love. We also love, uh, besides comic books, we also really love action movies. So uh, the thought was, hey, what if we set a, a, wrote a modern day action movie style thriller, but it feels like it's from the 80s. Nice. So that's, okay. yeah, that was the series we started with. And then it, during that one phone call, uh, we kind of went crazy and said, hey, let's do another one where it's modern day, but it feels like the 90s and then one from the 2000s. It, and, and then this was 20. It's like an, it's like an action cinema MCU. Yes, oh, that was it. the idea. Yeah. But, okay. but back before people were sick of the MCU. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, we could we could stop and 
can talk about the MCU for a little while because I I think I did actually sure, yeah. finally get to the point where I feel like they they have taken a wrong turn and I'm hoping that they'll write the ship because I feel like there's so much <laughs> more that can be done. It's like great, great stories to mine. And I, I feel like maybe they're making too safe of bets. I feel like maybe they're trying too hard and, and you know, somebody here is going to be angry at me for saying this, but I think they're trying too hard to be inclusive. <laughs> and I think that it's ruining some of what they were able to do um, in, in trying to speak to everybody. You end up speaking to nobody. There's a line in the Incredibles uh, dash says, if everybody's special, it's just another <laughs> way of saying nobody's special. Yeah. I mean, yes. it's not, <clears throat> I mean, yes, I agree that it's, it's, it's not that they're trying to be, be too ex- inclusive for, for the sake of diversity. They're doing it because they feel like that's how you include more people and more money. So they're not right. doing it in a, in an organic way. If they're not, hiring the right people with the right voice and messages like i I feel like the first captain marvel was amazing but the but this marvels feels like i don't want to say pandering but it feels like uh there's no real real direction it's like a money grab and you know it's disney they're gonna do that (laughs) yeah Uh, i'm alan here and i will say i represent the i'm fine with what i'm seeing i'm the not too picky person sure uh I'm yeah, enjoying the, the, MCU. It's not as obviously it's not going to be as good as the the phase 1, phase 2 stuff, you know, all the way up through the end game, which was just it's a mic drop the fact that they took that built that story over 10 years and yeah, it with the Infinity absolutely. War. As I, a I, I it's just how do you follow? The problem is how do you follow something like that that big? I, I agree with you, but I think that that's what they were able to do all the way up to it. I don't know when we saw the first Avengers movie that any of us understood what they were building toward. And each movie felt True. like this great event that just you were like, I can't believe that they were able to do that. With a very few missteps, Iron Man 3 probably didn't deserve to exist. Um, and <laughs> a, a couple of the the early Thors are better than people say, but still not to the level Um I, I like they just had this ability to churn out stories with real characters that had real stakes and felt important. Yes. And then suddenly they came out with uh, the the legend of Shang-Chi. And I thought there was so much potential and the movie itself was fairly good, but then they did nothing with it. They didn't like invest in that story and pull it forward at all for how many years now. And yeah, that's right. They, like, there's no cohesive fiber uh, even though there are a lot of like little Easter eggs and mentions of other things going on. Um, and and so I think it's lost its way in, in that sense. I think the I most they that. did was they connected uh, She-Hulk by having, because the Abomination fought. That's right. Uh, that's right. Yeah. So they brought Wong and the Abomination into uh, She-Hulk. That feels lazy. I enjoy yeah. <laughs> I really enjoy Shang-Chi and She-Hulk, but I feel like, like you said, there was potential, but they were just more interested in putting out content. True. Calling all self-published authors. If you live in the United States and you've always wanted to see your books in bookstores, this may be the most important ad you'll hear in 2023. Listen carefully. No matter where you are in your publishing journey, it's not too early to position yourself to pursue brick and mortar bookstore distribution. But if you're a self-published author, you've probably heard getting your books in stores is next to impossible. That's no longer the case. For just $5, you'll receive a lifetime membership to the Self-Published Author Co-op. When you join, you'll have access to a members-only community with a detailed roadmap on how to get your books ready for bookstore distribution. Joining our community does not guarantee bookstore distribution, as there's a limited availability each month to be a featured author. And that's why the cost of a lifetime membership is less than a cup of coffee. Whether you're just about to publish your first book or you're selling thousands of copies a month, if you don't have your books in bookstores, the Self-Published Author Co-op is the easiest, most efficient way to get national distribution of your books. Click the link in the show notes to join now. Okay, so you wanted to create for your um, readers something that felt like an... uh, yeah, the idea was we had these four characters from different decades, representing different decades, yep. all taking place today. Uh, but what we did was we wrote four standalone novels introducing each of the characters, and then we didn't mm-hmm. really see any sales from that. It was very lukewarm response, and this is it was okay. one of the four. 
got the the most, and it was yeah, the guy the basically four- that we modeled after Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, yeah, okay. Oh, it came out funny. first, and uh, we we probably had like uh, the most time right spent the most time planning and writing that one, and I feel like that was probably to its benefit because what we decided was this is we were following the the twenty bo- the Michael Anderley twenty books to fifty k formula at that point. We were like, hey, let's just keep writing this one series because the idea was all four of these characters that come together in our uh, our Avengers. But what we decided to do was carry this initial character uh, forward and then just bring the other characters into we that. Cro- yeah, we crossed the other characters over in his series yeah. well, rather than having all of them join a separate series like yeah, the Avengers. Then, yes. Right, so what, right. what we did was like the book one was out. Uh, Alan was writing book two at the time. And then I said, well, I already know what happens at book two because we already planned it out. So I'll start book three at the same time. Oh, nice. So we were writing two and three simultaneously, and then we handed off the drafts, and then we had them available for pre-order relatively cl- close together. Mm-hmm. Even though the first book had been out for almost a year, uh, we had sure. the second and third available for pre-order, and then we saw an uptick in sales. Yeah. So by the time like the fourth and fifth book came out, it was like a, a rocket. It just took off. Like people oh, nice. were picking up that, 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 that flavor. Yeah, the Amazon, that Amazon, that 28-day window of between releases that people talk about. Mm-hmm. that authors talk about it was really happening for us we really saw That's it cool. when books two and three came out yeah i have we, i have not we, had that experience before but i also don't know that i've taken advantage of the 28 day window like i've never done a rapid release before yeah uh it's tough we, <laughs> but there's two yeah. of us so we could take advantage yeah but we we kind of slipped and and we're releasing them slower in the later books so by book uh i want to say seven we had like like our peak audience and then eight and nine we made the mistake of taking our foot off the gas and and kind of just the the sales and and the revenue just coasted to the lowest it's been in like five or six years and we're now slowly building that up by doing this rapid release of the new series oh let let this let this episode be a cautionary tale for the and one of hope podcast and And one of hope hope. a hopeful (laughs) cautionary tale we in yeah we basically stopped our output around 2018, 2019 almost came to a complete stop. And then our sales and ranking dropped with it. Okay. And so well, we just, two- cause we saw a level of success early that we thought, Oh, it's going to be this forever. Oh, sure. We were exciting. And you it was kind exciting. of excited. But, to- but well, interesting. yeah, okay. we worked so I wanna, hard. I want to talk about that. Those books out. We just wanted to take a break. That makes sense. I'm sorry. So let's, well, let's talk about that too. I want to first, one thing you said earlier for listeners to clarify, the 20 books to 50K group, um, I'm fairly new to it actually myself. So I don't even know that I know the philosophy behind the group. Uh, mm-hmm. So I figured for any listeners who are like me, describe what that philosophy yes, is. Yes, of course. Uh, it so, sounds like it's probably self-explanatory. Yeah, Michael Anderley uh, started the the process like way early on before he had his 20 books. What he, what he realized was uh, he was doing the math at, at based on like, the, the numbers he was seeing from like three books being released. And he realized if I mm-hmm. write 20, do- uh, 20 books, I can make $50,000 a year and they just go live in Mexico. Where it, the it wasn't even a lot. Came. Like it wasn't each book. Like he said, if each book can generate $7 a day, right? Yeah. It was some, yeah. It was that like was a, his number. Like if a I modest can write, amount. Cause his books were making about $7 a day for the three books each. And he thought, oh, if I expanded that to 20 books, I'll make, I'll generate 50, about 50,000 a year in revenue. Yeah. And then I can go, retire in mexico and but, live off the book revenue but what happened but he saw time, something different happen yeah by the time book five came out he was he had already cleared like ninety thousand. yeah he wasn't counting well, on the exponential growth of a growing yeah. series right but he That's writes cool. fast yeah he writes fast so he realized this rapid release approach would work uh mm-hmm. most people obviously aren't gonna write as fast as he does so what we do is we build that that catalog before we release yes we, we're it's like it's harder because you know you're sitting on books, but uh, ultimately, if you can do a rapid release, you can. Amazon will help you out. So the idea is the the like when a book comes out on Amazon, you get like this thirty to a twenty eight day, but it's like a thirty day hot new release window, and then for uh, sixty days, it's still uh, like uh, bumped up a little bit by the algorithm, and then by ninety days, it it, it tends to fall off where they stop okay. really pushing it where you're relying more on organic after that point. Yeah. So if you you release these books within 
like these 90 day windows closer to 30 is is best but if you release them within that 90 day window the previous book gets a, a bit of a bump as well still because it's in that window yeah so the idea is uh their philosophy you hear a lot is the best marketing for your book is the next the next book in the series right. and i know that's uh not quite the ammo program as we just discovered <laughs> mm-hmm. right <laughs> but uh we we saw success with that but uh you know, our, our initial series is done now. Like we're in this 20 books formula and we wrote a nine book series and stopped. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. You know what? And so that's the next thing I want to talk about too, is that you, you mentioned uh, that you kind of took a break, which again, we'll get there, but I was already starting to think about this idea of if you take advantage of the rapid release style um, and we, we touched on this very briefly when I interviewed Joanna Penn um, and she basically said the same thing like you could just hold books and then do rapid release so you're not necessarily writing that fast but you are releasing that quickly um if right. you were to blend that or fold that into the ammo method what you could do is have your books available through your own bookstore on ammo you could advertise through facebook you could be selling those um and gaining reviews on places i wonder if you could put it on goodreads or if if that would disrupt the process i i don't know this is me thinking out loud but you mean like start you yeah, can sell them and it, not actually publish them on Amazon. Um, you would have to go yeah. through uh, probably Ingram Spark to to order your copies um, if you were going to do paperbacks. But yeah, I mean, you could do the whole process without using Amazon and you could be that's, selling. Your, yeah, books. you're probably talking about a, a plan that's braver than what we're willing to do. <laughs> okay. You don't want to abandon Amazon. No, no, I'm not actually talking about it, abandoning no, no, Amazon. Yeah. What I'm talking about is selling the books. So you're not ever sitting on them. That's what I'm talking about. Yes. You use the power oh, of oh, ammo to actually oh, sell the books through Shopify. Have them really somewhere um, else and first. sit oh. on them. Yeah, sit on them for and a while. And then just rapid release through so Amazon. Ooh, that's happen. interesting, actually. That's, that's correct. That is exactly like the process that. I'm thinking of. I, and you know why? You can let me tell you why. sales while you're waiting. Let me tell you why I like that, because you can be making money off of these books. That's right. And then if for some reason you want to, like when you finally rapid release them, you want to go with Amazon's uh, select program, the the exclusivity, you can just like keep the print ones available. No, you can keep the print ones available. You just can't sell eBooks anywhere. And then just just do this exclusive release. I, you know, we we kind of made a mistake. Our new series that we're launching now is... Kindle Unlimited is, is Amazon exclusive. Uh, mm-hmm. This was before we discovered the ammo program. We were like mm-hmm. book three had just come out when we discovered this program. So uh, I would like our goal is to call it a mistake though. Yeah, that's true. That's true because <laughs> it, it you make good money with Kindle Unlimited, but you make less money if it's a shorter book. <laughs> that's true. what we're doing. And we're yeah. writing, we write shorter books in general. I okay. would love to not be tied to Amazon for exclusivity. Like our mm-hmm. our uh, main, our flagship series, the one that the action movie style, that's going out of Kindle Unlimited this month. And we're going to be, it's full steam ahead on ammo to, to sell that one. Yeah. But like this new series is going to be locked into Amazon for a while. Oh so. yeah. If I could add something about the the ammo <laughs> program, the, the reason we, we just started recently, a couple of months ago, we signed up. Mm-hmm. But the reason we're doing it is because for years we didn't like the idea of being Amazon exclusive. You know, right. we liked the the benefits of being on the Kindle Unlimited program, but it just that fear of like we don't want all our eggs in one basket, right? And so we always had this plan to do our own thing, to have our own website and market it that way. And then we just didn't really have the we didn't know how a structure. We didn't really know how to do it. And then that's when we found Ammo, and we said, "This is exactly what we've been trying to do." So that's why we signed up, yeah. and that's the process we're going to take uh, in the future. Absolutely, I, and and um, I mean, Ammo is an amazing, amazing program for that. One of the things that comes up probably every episode of the podcast is just the simple fact that you're able to capture your readers' information and build relationships with them. Yes, sometimes I think we frame that in a way that sounds like almost predatory, but the reality is, if I go into a bookstore and I talk with the the owner of the bookstore. So I build a relationship with her. She knows my name. Um, and when I come in, if I'm frequent enough to that bookstore, she starts to understand my tastes and and like build that relationship. And there's loyalty there. There's nothing predatory at all. Exactly. It's just really creating yes. the digital version of what would happen in a physical space. Yeah. Like, because right now, I mean, uh, I'm sure you already know, but like maybe your listeners don't want to hear this harsh truth, but Amazon does not share data. 
with anybody. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You don't know. All you know is how much money they're paying you. That's all you know. And how yeah. many- it's not I mean, like we're doing we're not doing this for like any kind of predatory reason. It's really just tracking metrics. It's how yeah. you improve any skill in life. You yep. can't you don't just go into the gym, and just re- lift random amounts of weight. You <laughs> track right. your progress. So you know exactly what you need to lift. Yeah. You can't just track your progress in the mirror. You have to. Yeah. Yes. Progressive overload. So and the, I, so the more information, the more metrics you can track, the better you can improve. Yeah. And I think that probably someone like Jonathan Yanis and uh, his wife, Jennifer, would probably say there's a, a great argument to be made for having uh, your your boat in two oceans at the same time, which they do. I think a lot of KU stuff for some of their their books and they do mm-hmm. some exclusive um or, or I should say wide um, books as well that they sell through ammo. And if you can have both pumping at the same time, that's really where you can make a, a, a ton of money as an author is, is being available in both places. Because what happens on Amazon, even though you don't capture the data, is that if somebody is doing your, your KU series and then they finish that series, they may go back to you and realize, oh, they have all these other books. They're not on KU and they might buy them from uh the the kindle program anyways and so you're getting mm-hmm. double dip i guess in and yeah no i see that in, in both that's worlds. that's kind of what we're doing right now yeah yeah or that's that's, the, that's our plan going that's our near future plan we have the one series the brand new series that we're trying to release monthly and it's in kindle unlimited and then we're going to have the older series that we're going to be using the ammo program specifically on yeah so i want to talk briefly about the break, because there's something healthy in taking a break. Um, and there's something healthy about having multiple focuses or being able to shift our focus. And one of the things that I've never been super comfortable with is the idea that I'm going to write a thousand books in my, in my life, which that, (laughs) that, that process is very much, if not, if not like explicitly told, it is implicitly told that that you have to write more books in order to be a full-time author and i I would love to be in that place where i could actually write two books a year and make a full-time comfortable living and you know go to mexico or wherever it might be kind of that 20 books to 50k Mm -hmm. i don't want to have to write uh seven or eight or nine books a year and that's just me personally did you feel that way at all is that why you took the break or what was the break fueled by yeah so the thing is uh it's just I I am more in line with what you're doing with with, with your philosophy. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, Brian writes so much faster than me, and he has like he's just he loves writing more and more books. I don't want to write as many books. I don't want to mm-hmm. say that in a bad way. Like it's more like I can't write as many books as Brian does. He writes so much faster than me. So I think uh, in that sense, I was feeling a little burnout trying to write the number of books we wanted to write. Uh, so we, we've been working on a system in the going forward where a majority of the book writing he can handle. And I would do things more like marketing and book cover design and the administrative stuff like that. That way we're doing equal tasks, but we're focusing on what we're more capable of capable of doing. Yeah. So the process is, is basically like I, we plan out the book. I do a first draft and he makes sure I'm not doing anything dumb and it all makes sense. (laughs) But as far as, yeah, as far as the break goes, uh, we were fortunate to have obviously full-time employment. Like I Mm -hmm. had, a like all the bills are covered by the day job. So that, that one year we had a six figure year from writing was like, a great year for us, but it wasn't, it didn't yeah. like, it wasn't, it was life-changing, I should say, but it wasn't yeah. like enough to to quit our day job. So when I took a break, part of it was uh, not, Alan wasn't the only one burnt out. I was kind of burnt out on that series because that initial series, we started small. It was like a uh, classic hero vigilante has to stop the bad guys and rescue someone. It turned into like this globe trotting <laughs> espionage techno the thriller. story got huge yeah and we're like i can't I, we can't make this any bigger i don't want to go what is it going to do go to space like fast and furious <laughs> yeah so that, that was the other thing we wanted to write these ridiculous scenes like we wanted to outdo the fast and the furious <laughs> and then they released like part six or seven or something like that we're like we can't keep up there's, with these guys. there's stuff always out get ours yeah if it's <laughs> so in ridiculous. movies there's and we love doing our books we're like okay we're just gonna do we're going to stick to our lane, stay in our yeah. lane. Yeah. <laughs> no pun intended. Fast. No pun intended. Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
Um, so they, they were too fast, too furious. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they, got, they just got too fast. Yeah. Um, you know, I will admit, I'm going to out myself right here. I've actually never seen any of the Fast and Furious movies. I know all about them, but I've never seen a single one of them. Um, you know, I think that's R. okay R. to Paul say. Walker. They're very polarizing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're very polarizing. Yes. Uh, but I feel like if you get it, you you understand what they're trying to do with how ridiculous it is. You're like fully on board. Yeah. But if you, I think if so. you don't like that style, it's like that's, yeah, I get it. It's dumb. It's cheesy. And, and they're basically superhero movies with cars. Yeah. Like they're not for everyone, but they're for us. <laughs> yeah. And for, for the people who are going to read your books. I think that that's yes. such an important uh, part of this. I'm actually in the process. As soon as we get done, I'm going to report, record a podcast that I'm going to put out today, um, which just, you know, on, on, the off note, I've never been this late to do a Monday episode before, but there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, but talking about the idea of embracing what you're writing and believing in it, there's something really powerful that happens when you market your books, when you believe in your books. Uh, yes. I went to uh, a book fair this weekend and I was talking with one of the writers there who had a table and he was trying to explain his book to me and and he was like well you know it's multiple genres and i really had a hard time going traditional so i ended up going with a hybrid publisher and you know he's like he's like it's just kind of a weird book and i was like hey <laughs> you can tell me it's a weird book but if i hear you say that across the aisle to anybody who's thinking about buying your book i'm going to make a fuss because you need to believe in the weirdness and yeah. what you're doing and that your readers are going to love and embrace that. You got to have a pitch for this yeah. thing that comes from your soul. Um, and, and and I love how you guys talked about the Fast and the Furious and acknowledge it's not for everybody, but you also didn't shy away from the fact that you love it and you you, you really mm -hmm. embody the whole ethos that that goes into something like the Fast and the Furious or Arnold Schwarzenegger um, yes. and, and his absurd action adventures. If, if you love Arnold Schwarzenegger, you, you might want to read our books. Yeah, it's, yeah, they're they're, they're like that. Uh, but we did so, notice uh, that there's people making excuses for the reason they write books, and like because it, it's it's imposter syndrome. Like we were writing thrillers, so people are going to think, so. "Oh, you're writing like Tom Clancy stuff." We're not writing Tom Clancy stuff, <laughs> right? <laughs> like we we're not even attempting. We're not, not even the, aiming for that. We're we're writing yeah. what we wanted to read, and you know, we grew up. That's reading. the thing. The yeah, the ideal reader uh, analog that. Uh, we, we first saw, heard that in a Stephen King book on writing where he mm -hmm. talks about writing for the ideal reader, mm -hmm. you know, and then we have the advantage of well, I write for Brian and Brian writes for stories for me. We just happen to like the same thing. Yeah. yeah. So and that makes it simple. And then that way we can write basically with full belief in what we're doing. There's a whole thing about writing to a market. And I agree with that idea that people, you know, if you write a book to a market that exists, people will buy the book. But we don't always fit in every market. Like the action thriller thing, for example, uh, a lot of those tend to be very gritty, lot, highly detailed about uh, the way governments work. And, you know, just you need yeah. to be so accurate in your research. And we didn't want we're not as excited about that as we are about a guy that flips a car over with his bare hands. <laughs> yeah. Which is a funny thing about that, it is so ridiculous. It is ridiculous. But if you're it's into happy. that, you're into it. Yep. But we, and we we're make okay sure, yeah, we just make sure we found out if you make sure uh, this is from from uh, Mark Dawson's mistake. As long as you're accurate with firearms and explanation of that, <laughs> people will accept the dumbest stuff. Just don't put a safety on a Glock like Mark Dawson did, which, you know, he's it's funny that he's so successful and still trying to live that down, that one mistake down. I mean, he's probably yeah. not anymore. He, he's not thinking yeah. that anymore. He, but. <laughs> he probably still brings it up from time to time. That is really yeah. funny that you yeah. mentioned that because that's where I, I heard have, it from. Like he, he's brought it up. Yeah, my my detective series. Uh, I had somebody who bought it and and like he gave it a five star review and then he came in behind and he's like i i absolutely love your book i'm really looking forward to reading the rest of the series i also want to offer up to you to be a reader just so that i can make sure you don't make any more gun mistakes because and he gave me the reason why <laughs> i made this gun mistake and i was like well, holy crap i didn't realize that was going to be an issue uh, but yeah that's that's the only time i've ever had that particular situation happen where someone's like i just want to help you never make that mistake again it's, it's too important yeah the vast majority of readers yeah, the vast majority of readers aren't going to notice or care, but the people that do notice will write it's a bad a, review about it, and then other people will start paying right. attention. 
So we do right. we yeah. do uh, enough gun research to the point where people will say, "I read your book. You guys sure know a lot about guns, or you guys sure, <laughs> sure love guns." <laughs> like we do our research this just is... to make sure. Yeah, um, I do want to ask that. So and we're not in, we're in, not gun nuts or anything. We just <laughs> yeah. we're interested exactly. in the topic is all. Yeah, well, you want you want to get it right. You don't want to make the mistake. I, I yeah. am curious. Mm-hmm. Um, I personally tend to gravitate towards writing things that I don't have to research. I find research Same. of this kind <laughs> repulsive. So the weird thing is if you were to talk to my wife, she would say he's always researching something like just constantly researching. But when it comes to making fiction, I'm pulling from what I've researched organically and I'm I'm threading that into my books, but I don't actually want to have to stop composition to be like, I wonder what was going on in <laughs> Omaha in 1983. Yeah. You know, like it, and it, you, you already said the same. So I'd love to hear kind of your thought process on yeah, that. Yeah. We don't like doing a lot of research if we don't have to as well. I like it's, it's the, the live free or die hard. Uh, we're hacking all of the <laughs> internet kind of story that we write. So yeah. I don't want to study IP address and how hacking really works. So we just kind of throw like jargon around to make us seem we, like our characters know what they're doing. And then, we, but the, yeah, I don't want to say we don't research. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah. Uh, well, I was like, yeah, we do, it. we do the, the, uh, we tend to stick with what we know, but if we don't know, we tend to like, you know, make sure our characters act like they know. Yeah. And then, and then that'll, that'll convince the reader. What we have is we have a, had a character that would get into these long winded explanations about stuff, but then the other characters would cut them off. So you think they know what they're talking about, but we don't right. have to actually write it. It's a it's a brilliant writing technique. If this yeah. were a writing technique podcast, we would dive deep into that because yes. I, I also I do the same thing. I try to give you the sense. Um, my mom was a nurse, so I have and I, I went through a couple of years of college where I learned some like anatomy and things. So I do mm-hmm. tend to use a lot of anatomy and health type of stuff. But if you nice. had a real doctor or nurse reading my book and paying close attention, they would be like, he doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> but it is convincing enough. And I know enough to sound dangerous. And I think that that's that's a really big part. It, wrapping it back into the marketing idea, that's a big part of being successful as a marketer is when you're there to sell the book, whether it's through your landing page that you built through Ammo or uh, the description that you have on Amazon, or if you're at a book fair talking to a reader, it's that sense of like, oh yes, this book is is deep and profound and mm-hmm. entertaining and exciting. It's the way yes. that you wrap the package that mm-hmm. matters so much. There was uh, also, yeah, one one of the books we wrote, uh, the character has to ride like this really nice high-end motorcycle, right? We know nothing about motorcycles. We've never been on motorcycles. Brian did all the research for it, had the guy on the motorcycle, and we got a five-star review from a guy that said he's like a professional motorcycle racer, and he loved how accurate we got all of the information. And I'm going to tell you exactly why I picked the motorcycle he picked, because I love the movie Yes Man with Jim Carrey. Yeah. And he takes that nurse's Ducati. So I was like, well, he's going to ride a Ducati. <laughs> That's the, the That's level of brilliant. research we start with. Yeah. Another one, that. we wrote a book where the, the setting happens in France. And I was so stressed <laughs> out having to research France, just locations no in kidding. France. Yeah. And how the police operate there. And, that was know, that book we did the most gun research. laws and everything. We did mm-hmm. the most research on that because we also had like a. Uh, an evil weapon that the bad guys were using. And we traced the the roots back to like the, those, uh, what do they call like dumb dogs from Vietnam, those in yeah. bombs from Vietnam. We're like, we did so much research for that one book. And it's probably my favorite of that action movie series. And it's book four. So it's a good jumping on point too. That's how we wrote it. Yeah, we, we wrote it. It's yeah. a nine book series. We wrote them in three trilogies, basically <laughs> with an overarching storyline over it all. Okay, that's what I was going to ask you to next. And this is just really my own interest. But uh, like my my detective series, I wrote the first three books intentionally so that they stand alone. You can dive in on Mm -hmm. any one of them and feel like, okay, I know what's going on. There's nothing that's, you know, you didn't need to know what happened in book one in order to read book two. And then I thought by book four, if I have to keep doing that, I will not be able to delve as deeply as I want to into the overarching story. And so I, by book four, you have to have read something that came before to get a sense of what's going on. Um, do you, you said you wrote them in trilogies and then there's one big story. Could you read like the second trilogy without having read the first trilogy uh, or do yes. you have to start from the beginning? 
You know, that's, we, yes. we want to say can, yes. But. Yeah, you can read the, the second yes. trilogy. <laughs> yeah, well, I yep. mean, because we just we explain what happened. Yeah, we spend a chunk trilogy. of book four doing go, you doing like going back and like recap uh, recapping stuff just yes. through exposition. Sure. So you can read the second trilogy. However, you can't read the third trilogy because we didn't do it like that. Because like mm-hmm. you said, they're going to have to read the other books at a certain point. So what we yep. decided was. If they're, you know, if they read book four, if, if it's not like, you know, a, a Marvel comic or like these, these ongoing series where it's like book 20 is out and you're like, well, I don't want to read the first 20. No, you could just pick it up anywhere. We right. didn't, it's only nine books. So we figured they're going to have to read all nine at some point, or at least four through nine. What, what we did yeah. do though, is even though they're trilogies they're each book is a standalone story. Yeah. And then each trilogy no is, is uh, a storyline. And then the nine book series is a long storyline. Yeah. So you could nice. get a complete story from any book you read without feeling like there was a cliffhanger, you know, without yeah. feeling cheated out of a, a full story. Like, oh, we they had, just want me to buy the next book. We had right. four main villains in each of those four standalone series originally. And then mm-hmm. when we combined all the series, we brought all of those villains together as one large organization. Oh, so, nice. okay. yeah, the, the first trilogy introduces it. I mean, yeah, the first trilogy takes out the first bad guy and introduces the organization. And yeah. then the rest of the series, they're chasing down the rest to, to shut it down. So one more one more question about the actual writing itself that I'm curious about. Uh, and then mm-hmm. we'll move back into the marketing side of things, because that's why people are here for marketing. marketing. <laughs> that's why we're marketing. here. We want to know. Too. <laughs> that's right. Yes. OK, so um, my, my last question is, did you know how things ended before you started did you have a rough idea of how the nine books would go or did you discover along the way and and this isn't necessarily even a question of outlining because i have a rough idea of how my nine book series goes but i still am having ideas about it when i walk my dog in the morning all the time yes so we had a rough idea of how it was going to end very rough though it was far smaller in scale the book exploded to like, like I said, this global espionage thing. And then as you're going, you're adding more and more because the the books that you're writing, the characters evolve way differently than you expected. Yes. Uh, 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 so the, you know how it, it sounds really cheesy to say, but some writers say what they'll write a character for to a point where at one point in the story, the character tells the writer how the story goes. Right. Uh, have you heard sure. people say that? Yes, and I've experienced it actually. Yeah, exactly. Yes, so yes. we thought that was the cheesiest thing. We're I like, no, was, I was come on, garbage. these people are. Yeah, this is ridiculous. Yeah. And it started happening to us. So a lot of the stuff is we had an idea of where we wanted the story to go, but that's not where the story always went. That's not where the yeah. characters wanted the story. The to characters go. picked a different. It's as crazy as it sounds. The characters picked a different ending. Yeah, for what I, we I, were intending. Completely understand. So I'm I'm reading right now. I just got into uh, Robert Galbraith. Um, the cuckoo's calling mm-hmm. um the silkworm um and like I'm, I'm on book three right now i can't think of the title off the top of my head but it's so so flipping good and it <laughs> absolutely has that feel of i think that you know rob, rob <laughs> knew where rob was going when rob started writing the book series but there's also a sense of discovery and you get these moments where you realize the character is fully surfaced, fully alive, fully realized and dictating the yeah. terms of the story. And when you read that, you know, you're reading it. That is, I think why Stephen King says that he doesn't outline because he yes. wants you to understand that there are moments where the character intervenes and says, Oh, I have an idea. And then the story goes a different direction. It's never uh, happened to me so clearly as it did in book three of my series, but it does happen. And when it does, the, the, the leading feels quite nice. Yeah, yes. that's the beauty. Yeah. Like, is the further you get in your series, you're gonna start weaving in elements from the earlier books, and it's gonna feel like it's planned. And then the readers gonna be like, "This is wow, they must have known all along." Like, no, this character <laughs> right. was like the character that saves the day, and and like book eight of our series was only supposed to be in one book. He was only introduced yes. in book one, but now he's like that. this major character. Yeah. I love hearing that. I, I won't talk too much about the, the future books, but I had that moment too, where there's a, a bartender named Annie who's in book one. She, I, I honestly didn't mean for her to be anything. And then she kept, <laughs> kept coming back in each book and having these moments. And finally yeah. I was like, Oh, I totally get her role in a series. And it's really fun to discover those things. Yeah. That's cool because it's they fill a role. They fill that, that gap that you didn't realize the story would have had, or like 
a, yes. a later story needs a, a character in a certain role. He's like, well, I've already got this character. Might as well bring him back. Yeah. So yeah, we've yeah. done that with several other characters uh, and, and they've become important uh, supporting cast, but the book revolves around like this main, these main four characters. And then for some reason, this fifth support character became pivotal to the team. So yeah. And it was cool to see. So switching back to the marketing conversation, um, you had you had talked earlier about knowing that you didn't want to be reliant on Amazon mm -hmm. uh, for your readership. Let's talk pre-ammo, and you've only been in ammo for a little while, so there's not a ton of post-ammo to talk about, but pre-ammo, what kind of things were you doing to we capture readers and, and build loyalty? Yeah, this is during the the whole break thing. All we did was run ads on on Amazon, and then yeah. uh, we made a couple of half hearted attempts to do Facebook ads. But then Alan discovered this Facebook advertising program mm -hmm. a couple of months ago. This is, yeah, this is very recently, and yeah, it okay. helped us out a lot. So we tested it. Facebook it tested it on our flagship series, and it it worked wonders. But okay. the, the series was still locked in Amazon exclusive. Mm -hmm. And then a Alan just sends me this link of uh, of the ammo program saying he's saying, I want to do this. And yeah. So, I yeah, what happened was once we started advertising in the Facebook thing, you yeah. know, once we got our Facebook ads going more and more Facebook ads geared towards writing appeared in my feed. Of course. Yeah. So because yes. of that, that's how I discovered the ammo program, because he's advertising on Facebook. That's right. But uh, also in, in terms of breaking away, not ammo specific but also getting away from amazon our focus was building an email list because that whole yes. idea that the email list is yours that's right it's it's not it's it's independent of uh, independent of any uh platform so yes. that's what we wanted to do we wanted to build an email list we wanted to build out our website and then uh we weren't exactly sure the roadmap to do it so by finding facebook first we were encouraging people to try and sign up or follow us at least through amazon if not signing up for our email address. And then so how how were you uh, doing that prior to to ammo? We weren't. Was we had basically in all of our books, we had we would have sign up for if you liked this book and then you know sign up for our email list. Also, we would have lead magnets in the ends of the books. For for example, one of them we said in book one of the action series we have uh, if you like the story, sign up for an email list for an extended epilogue. And it was just like a few thousand words. And that's just from, an extended uh, scene that text on the end of the first book. Oh, cool. Get that idea from Newsletter Ninja. Newsletter Ninja gave us the uh, okay. yes, <laughs> the lead magnet idea. And it works. <clears throat> I love so that. Okay. basically lead magnets was what we were hoping to do. And, you know, yeah. it's, we weren't hugely successful at it. I do want to bring up though that we've had a mailing list for years and we <laughs> are terrible at it. We don't email enough. We didn't know yeah. how to build it. Right. So, Cautionary tale, everyone. Yeah. So this ammo program, we're we're essentially starting from scratch. Even though we've got sure. six hundred subscribers, we're treating it like we're starting from scratch. We're not abandoning those those subscribers, obviously, but we're going to take this ammo approach. You layer, it yeah, feels so, so much nicer. You layer, and this is important for anybody who is joining Ammo based on the podcast or any of Steve that Steve's ads on on Facebook. Anywhere that you you join in the stream, understand that if you have neglected your subscribers up to this point, it's okay. But then every single subscriber you have that you haven't had a specific email plan for, consider them dead. Consider them mm -hmm. people who never bought your book. You have their email addresses, but you got them uh, not through relationship building. And so I tag all of those people onto um, like the freebie funnel instead of the purchase funnel, because I want to treat them like they've never met me before. And you'd be surprised how often that's the case. In fact, even since joining Ammo, and I've talked about this openly, um, I was never good at emailing in the beginning. I was more focused on getting the Facebook ad to work. Mm -hmm. Part of that had to do with the fact that I was selling goods I didn't even have written yet. So I was selling a book in pre-order uh, as part of my four book package in order to have the price point where I could be successful on uh, Facebook ads. Now, 
what that meant is once they bought my books, I didn't have a follow-up email in mind of like, how do I get anything else out of them? But when I <laughs> changed my mindset of how do I get something from them to how do I give something to them, that really revolutionized what I was doing. And so now I have a giving program for everybody. I'm going to give you something from me that I'm not asking you to buy anything. There's options, but there's no there's no hard ask right now. And when I have more books, I'll shift that. But you just treat those people who have been kind of sitting uh, dormant for a while as never before purchased. And this is a such a long-winded way of saying, when I started <laughs> sending out these emails, you would be shocked how many people who had bought my books were like, oh, I never figured out how to download those. I literally <laughs> got those and I thought I bought these, but I never figured out how to get them. And I was like, oh my gosh. Yeah, that was the moment when you're like, wow, okay. Don't neglect we're your email about, list, folks. We're excited about this yeah, ammo program great. though, because it's it uh, like, it's, the path to the 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 access to our audience that we wanted and it starts with building that audience first and it, it, there's like a lot of potential in that so uh, we found at the right time because like i said we're all of our books in that flagship series are out of amazon exclusive like at, at the, the end, end of this month. month so we have this this you know 30 day runway to get everything set up and start building our or start testing i mean we're already testing the the headlines and stuff and, and the landing page stuff. But uh, it's, it, we see this, this bright future now because uh, like, I want to say the, the Facebook ads, the, the sales that is generated from this, this five-year-old series. It's like, yeah. we see this massive hope, like, Oh, I guess not everyone's read this book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Isn't that, isn't that a big, huge, huge light bulb moment when you realize that ammo actually has the potential to resurrect the books that you've written before. So yes, you were, yes. you were really counting on rapid release, but right now you're realizing, yes. okay, those books I wrote before I can advertise them on Facebook and reinvigorate them. It's mm -hmm. a huge relief that the idea that because you, you think, Oh, I had all these sales and this book is a little older. No one's interested anymore, mm. but it's just, you had, okay. Yeah. Even if you had a hundred thousand sales, there's millions and hundreds of millions of people yeah. reading books. They haven't seen yeah. your stuff yet. Absolutely. So that's actually another thing I'd like to say to the listeners. That I love in this episode specifically, we're getting into some things that have been maybe implicit in the podcast before, but we haven't stated out uh, outright. Um, your ads, if you have an ad set that that speaks to uh, maybe three million, five million, nine million people, understand that your budget to reach all of those people will mean that you're not going to reach all of those people for a very long time. So <laughs> yes, important true. realities to that is your ad is not fatigued. Um, your ad set is not fatigued. If you're experiencing kind of a downturn in sales, a couple of things could be happening. One, you could be uh, competing with the big boys. So there's a point mm -hmm. in the year right now, for example, when Penguin Random House, HarperCollins, FSG are all pumping a lot more money into the system to get those holiday sales. So you're competing right. with the big guys right now. If you're seeing a little bit of regression, okay, that's cool. Create a process for yourself where you can back away when necessary without giving up and, and put those ads out. And sure, you, you want to do all the things Steve tells you, but I think that there's this, this one sense for people who join Ammo, and I don't know for you too if this has happened before, where you're like, oh, the ad must be dead. The ad's not dead. Most likely, unless you had too small of an audience, the ad is still alive. It's just run into the brick wall of either the big boys, you know, quote unquote, big boys, big mm -hmm. girls. I don't want to be gender exclusive. <laughs> uh, it, it, and, and, and it's still alive. Doesn't mean you can't like kind of make it better, but just uh, yeah. understand if an ad worked before, it's going to continue to work. Oh, I'm glad you said that time. because uh, I probably yeah. would have panicked if that happened, even though Alan's in charge of the ads. I go. I'd have been like, we got to raise yes. the alarm. Yeah, we're, see we're seeing a little drop right now, but that's that's <laughs> the reason why. There was yes. a, I mean, there's a huge drop yeah. on October 31st, but we, you know, obviously we're like, oh, everyone's out trick-or-treating. No yeah. one's no one's reading right now, so. Right. Everyone's I, busy. Yeah. But I, I actually add, did have though, a great moment on Halloween night. I was, I, my boys were trick-or-treating and we'd been out for a while. My hands were kind of cold and, you know, so my hands are in my, my vest pockets and I pull out my phone and I'm like, there's not going to be any sales right now. And I checked and there was a sales and I was like, awesome. I just made <laughs> oh, nice. nice while trick-or-treating nice. with my kids. Like, that's such a good feeling. Very nice. That is yeah. the great feeling about, about selling books is you're just making money in your sleep. Yes, exactly. Not a lot yet. Not no, we will. either. We will. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I mean, there's a point where you will be making a lot and it'll be nice. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I want to bring up a point like when you're saying that the uh, 
the big dogs are are advertising like pumping a lot of money in advertising yep. they are yes they are boosting their holiday sales but it is a, like it's not hopeless at all because it's that it's like, like a That's rising right. tide lifts all boats because yeah all of our like the bulk of our sales come from that holiday season so there are a lot of readers looking for books everywhere so if you're even if your ads aren't performing as well as they would normally in the rest of the year you're going to see still huge return on on these uh, these investments because I love uh, holiday season is big for a lot of indie authors too so yeah i love that that's a really good point and i think i think that uh yeah well because well, we're not really competing with each other like no. like penguin random house wants to believe that they're trying to crush us like we're not no we we read <laughs> everyone else's books too you know we're not i Turn can't up the just, volume people Turn up yeah, the volume I, and listen. <laughs> I can't just be like, I only write, so I have something to read. Like, that's not it. Like, I read all the time. Mm-hmm. You know, I switched to, I just recently made the transition to writing full time this year. So now I have a lot more time to read. So mm-hmm. I'm up to like 60, 70 books for the year already. And awesome. and I don't write that many books, obviously. So I need to read everyone's yeah. books. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've started reading a lot more books since we mm-hmm. started writing. So it's yeah. just like maybe writers in general just read more and you're not just going to sit there and read over your own books over and over. How boring right. would that be? Absolutely. Oh my gosh, though. I have read every book I've written. I've read so many times that there's a, there's a fatigue yeah. point where you're like, this book is trash. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yes. <laughs> you just get so tired of reading over it. Uh, do you ever get, going. do you ever have this moment though? I know it's, it's kind of back padding, but you ever read something you wrote and you're like, I, I did a good job on that. I really like that line. I really like that scene. Yes. You still Absolutely. laugh at something someone says. Yes. Or when like when Stephen King says he finishes a draft and he puts it away for several mm-hmm. months and then you yes. read it in several months, you forget half of what you wrote and you're like, who wrote yes. that? That's yeah. great. It's I know. We, um, we do that all the time. Yeah, it's right. funny too. with Alan and I because there like, which is... Which one of us put that joke in there? Which yeah. one of us put that line in there? That is a legitimate yeah. question. It's not like if you wrote, if one person wrote it and went back and, and said, who wrote that? It's like, obviously you. This time, we don't know. It could be one of us, but it's it's yeah. fun to find those moments. I love that. I, I've had that same experience. And the, the, the best one I've had so far was um, there is an audiobook reader named XC Sands and... Um, I'm a big fan of Chuck Wendig. Uh, he's the only author that I have found so far that comes close to doing what Stephen King does. Um, mm-hmm. and, and so I'm just a huge fan of his writing. And Exe reads a portion of uh, two of his books, actually three. She She's one of his main readers. But I heard her voice and I was like, her voice is the voice of my main character. So I thought, one, she's going to be way too expensive because she's reading for a major, <laughs> major. Yeah. But I thought, why not just reach out? The worst thing she can do is say, no, I don't work with self-published authors, blah, blah, blah. But actually, I, I reached out and I said, hey, um, my character is uh, hard up on her luck, heavy smoking, heavy drinking, crazy lady, uh, badass detective. And uh, I think you would be the perfect person to voice her. And then after I sent it, I, I had this moment where I was like, I think I just accidentally insulted Exy because I was like, you <laughs> sound like a drug addict. <laughs> but no, she wrote she wrote back and she said, she sounds like my kind of person. Um, I'd love to talk with you about it. She said, I have a, a long wait list to get recording going. And, um, you know, my prices sometimes can price me out of self-published authors. And I talked to my wife about it and I was like, okay, cool. Let's spend four grand per book to do this with uh, an amazing oh talent. nice um and so we did yeah and and have you done it I, have you have you completed it the process of yeah two of them two of them are done the third one is scheduled i actually do have to raise funds for the third one i can't afford to do it right now but i'm on her schedule and i'm working mm-hmm. really hard to just kind of stock money away for this this third book that's but, cool yeah she is yeah, so good. we want to do that too like I we have had the moment you're talking about where you heard your writing or you experienced your writing and you were like, who wrote this brilliant piece of it? <laughs> oh. It's so good. It's such a good feeling. Yeah. 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 Listeners, show. listeners, don't be ashamed to be a big fan of your own work. That's yeah, right. you should be yes. your biggest fan. You should be yes. your biggest fan because yes. you're the ideal reader. You're writing stories you want to read. That was That's the whole idea. That's why we're yeah. doing this, right? Yes. We want to do audiobooks for all of our books, but like our first series is is done through Tantor and uh I mm. we loved hearing that like they picked a, an amazing narrator because we had our yeah. list too we're like we want we want uh RC Bray RC Bray who's the other one yeah. Luke Daniels we want like these big name people 
we wanted RC Bray first, but <laughs> yeah, they're like they almost laughed at us through email. You're not getting oh, no. him. But oh, then they gave no. us a list. They gave us a list, and and they found Roger Wayne, who does the mm-hmm. narration for our books. He's amazing. He's yeah, amazing. Great, and great stuff. It's the perfect uh, voice for that. And we wanted to use him for all of our other stuff, but we don't know how to make audiobooks outside of Tantor. So we we're gotcha. We have to research that. Can we pick your brain at some point after this? Obviously, most definitely. Yes, absolutely. Through email, so I don't want to cut in your schedule. <laughs> yeah, no, you're 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 absolutely fine. Um, with that in mind, we are we are kind of on the the, the sort of ramp down into the end mm-hmm. of the episode. So I want to talk about uh, this is something I haven't done before, but I'm really interested in hearing from you. Why keep doing this? Um, but from the lens of when you have millions of dollars and hundreds of thousands of readers, why would we what's... still write? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like Alan said earlier, I write all the time. I didn't grow up wanting to be a writer. W- what happened was we used to play and run role-playing games all the time, yes. like two or three times a week. And I was always writing campaigns and backstories. And then that just stopped, but I didn't stop. So I have all these ideas in my head that I just want somewhere. And then we have this Google doc that's this Google uh, folder that's just full of dozens of book ideas that I know we'll never get to. But if yeah. I don't have a way to get them out of my head, I'm going to go nuts. <laughs> we we look through that list every once in a while and get really excited. Like, we should do this book or this, this yeah. one is so ridiculous. Who it. wrote this one? <laughs> yeah. So it's like, even if... uh I'm not if when we start making our millions with our hundreds of thousands of readers, I'm still going to keep writing because I have too many ideas. And I know I'm not mm. acting like I'm special because that's such a common trait among all authors. Like you all yeah. have that list that you're not going to get to. Yeah. We all have it. It's it's just this this mm-hmm. uh, you come up with an idea. You're like, oh, that'd be fun to do. And you write it down. But uh, I'm also like because I also uh, draw and paint. And, and it's the same thing. It's like, I have these ideas in my head. I have to get them out. Hmm. And I just discovered that, uh, I don't, I'm, I'm sure Alan's the same way. I have aphantasia, which means I can't mentally picture anything. And oh, I don't have like this inner dialogue. That's a weird trait for an artist to have, but I think yeah. we both kind of have. Yeah. That. So it, if these ideas are stuck in my head, I can't visualize them until I write it down in full. So, okay. So we have to stop there because, uh, I'm not, I'm not actually familiar with the, the word or the term. I just discovered I, it this year. <laughs> I talk to my wife about this all the time that, uh, I actually write things in the book. I'll give my characters physical descriptions from time to time. And I note them because I actually never have seen my characters. I don't know what they look like outside of, um, like, uh, I use mid journey a little bit mm-hmm. for the AI mm-hmm. images. And and I've had some images where I thought like, that's pretty damn close to what I think I thought they were going to look like. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, but yeah, in, in general, like I don't see, even when I'm reading books and I don't know why that is, I literally envision faceless characters more often than not. I'm yeah. I'm yeah. exactly like, the same way. The only character okay. I know what it looks like is, is our main character. Cause Alan said he wanted to we, put Arnold Schwarzenegger in a book. And I was like, okay. So it's Arnold. So, well, yeah, that when, when we create characters, when we create main characters, we generally use an, an existing analog, an actor yeah. or, or a celebrity, some known person. And that helps us visualize the person because we yeah. know what they look like just from that. But creating someone from scratch in our head. No, we don't normally do that. We, we not, that is a question I might start asking traits. more people. Yeah. I have to know. Is this is this common? Like do more yeah. people <laughs> than I realize not actually I visualize know. anything? Also, what's happening in the brain? They, yeah, I want to know clearly, too. Clearly, we're entertained. Like we're entertained, but we're not seeing anything. We're experiencing yeah. it. So, I honestly I feel like so we're in the majority say, with that. Exactly. Because I hear so many people say it's a rare condition. It's like, I don't think it is. I think we're yeah. the norm and the people that can visualize stuff, they're the ones that, that have we're lucky an ability and yeah. we just lack it. I don't think it's like we don't have something that most humans have. I think it's the other way around. It's not a, I don't see it yeah. as an affliction or anything. Cause I, no, no, no. This, is, this is all I knew. And I just discovered people do when they say they visualize stuff or hear a, an inner a monologue that they're, they're talking literally. And I was like, I, yeah. what? I thought that was like a Hollywood elaborate, like exaggeration. Yeah. 
So it's it, what, what I mean, I'll, I'll add a little bit more, maybe fuel to the fire is I'm thinking about the Harry Potter movies. And when they came out, uh, Daniel Radcliffe and Emma Watson and uh, Rupert can't think Grint, maybe Gint, um, Grint, Gint, like, Glint, Gint, Gint, Grint, I think, yes, yeah, close. Grint, close. Those <laughs> three in my mind were a perfect fit for those three characters <laughs> and i grew up with them so i was working in a movie theater when the first when the first uh movie came out and i remember just thinking they look exactly like what i think that nice. the, the people mm. look like now granted jk rowling did have a picture of harry on her first book so that helped uh-huh. right on the cover um, yeah yeah so you kind of knew what they looked like based on the illustrations but then I also did hear people say specifically about Emma Watson that she was not who they pictured for Hermione. And I'm wondering if those are the people who are able to visualize. Probably. Right. right. Yeah, yeah. I hmm. think so. Yeah. I mean, because I generally don't like if I see a character in a movie from a book that I read, I don't normally say, well, that's not what I was thinking. <laughs> no, exactly. Never. I mean, I, I'm trying to think if there's ever a case where I thought, no, you think about James Bond as being probably the one uh, because he's had so many different faces, mm-hmm. your James Bond is probably linked to the moment when yes. you uh, you, when know, you started that, when you saw mm-hmm. your first James Bond movie. Yes, exactly. It's like Doctor Who, probably, right? Who's your Doctor Who? Yes, your that's right. Bond? Who's your Doctor Who? That's right. Yes, who's yeah. your James Bond? Perfect. Um, and I will also say that the one mistake they had, uh, bless his heart, is Pierce Brosnan because he was <laughs> a bad guy. <laughs> he was a bad guy in Miss Doubtfire. And you can't take, right. take a bad guy and make him James Bond. I, I don't know why. I but just can't he was, do it. He was a good guy in Remington Steel. Yeah. You're too but young, aren't you? Old You're too old. young, aren't you? I think I might I, I I think I just admitted that Daniel Craig is my James Bond. I think that's what yeah. just happened. <laughs> well, he's mine too. He's mine too. And I but I remember Remington Steel. I'm gonna be I'm yeah. gonna make people mad. I don't like James Bond movies. Oh, I don't know. Brian never. said that. Brian said that. Brian says <laughs> I never really cared for them. Like okay. there's that that time in June where where I forget which cable channel it was. They would just play the James Bond marathon. I was like, oh great, here we go. Yeah. Every okay, time I turn so on TV, it's gonna be a James Bond movie. I, I guess then my question uh, for you is have you read the books? I have not. Uh, the the okay. Ian Fleming books, I haven't read any no. of them. Yes. Okay, Brian. I want you to read uh, Casino Royale and then decide Royale. whether okay. you like James Bond or not. Casino Royale is one of my favorite books of all time. Now I will admit my former, uh, like closest reader and, and good, good friend, uh, JP, uh, I recommended he read Ian Fleming, James Bond, and he didn't, he didn't connect with it. But when I read it, I was like, this is so much better than the movies. It's, it's not even on the same nice. level. Like the books are so good. The oh, movies okay. that feel kind of pale in comparison, but yeah, I, I would say if you get some time, even audiobook it and and give it a listen, or you know, if I'm you checking the library app right now. Yeah, <laughs> yes, I love it. Do you use Libby? Yes, yes, I love Libby. Yeah, shout out to Libby. Shout out to Libby. <laughs> All right, on your public libraries, people. Yes, These exactly, exactly. Yes, get in your libraries. Have have your books uh, in libraries Use so them. people can yes. read them. Oh, we don't Use know how them. to do that. How do we do that? I want to do I'll that. <laughs> I, I, did a, I, I did a library series you can actually listen to, and I'll talk to you about that as well uh, another time. It's uh, okay. Yeah, it's not as hard as you think it is, but it can't, of course, be exclusive to Amazon. You do have to have yeah. it on Ingram in order to start the process. So. Okay. Okay. Tell everybody where they can find your books. I think I think we've kind of circled around it enough that people have a good idea. But it's always good to do the formal like. You know, right. Here, here uh, it goes. If you go to manningbrothersbooks.com, uh, the the site is not grossly outdated, but it, it, the, none, of the, <laughs> none of the new books are on there yet. The new series that we started, but manningbrothersbooks.com will take you to the the flagship series, plus those the other standalone books, plus the superhero trilogy that we actually did end up finishing. Uh, and then from there, you know, hopefully you'll find the rest on Amazon. So yeah, right. fantastic, <laughs> guys. This we, is we have way a... more fun than I expected. I mean, I, I was expecting it to be fun, but you you two are a, a riot of of good fun. Well, oh, we... that's good to hear because we were expecting uh, like the listeners might go, that guy talks too much because <laughs> <laughs> we sound exactly the same <laughs> and we talk over each other. That guy talks over himself somehow. He's insane. But it, like, <laughs> we also love podcasting, and and we haven't done it in a while, so it's like. This is our outlet. So we're going to let it all, we're going to let it all out here. 
Absolutely. Um, I am curious because we we did a, a non-visual this time, which worked out well for me. Um, but uh, do you actually, are you identical twins? Yes. 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 Okay. Because your voices are really similar. That is it's <laughs> trippy. I never knew who was talking. I didn't look a lot. Well, if you saw us now, the, you could tell us apart because Brian currently has a mullet. That's right. Like on purpose. Oh, on no. purpose. Because That's we live right. to, to book in uh, this conversation, no regrets. No regrets, people. <laughs> we no longer live our lives with manufactured regret. So I got the haircut in Brian, March. Brian the yes, mullet. In man. March, when I got laid off and decided to write full time, I got the haircut that Brian in 1990 wanted because my that hair is... had grown out already. So what can I say? Amazing. <laughs> No regrets, people. Gentlemen, we'll be in touch. Thanks so much. No regrets. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) Thanks for having us. This was great. Thank you for listening to TRBM. The theme music was provided by the ever-talented Christopher Talon. And hey, if you liked what you heard, share this show with other readers because what's the point of telling stories if nobody's listening?